Shoop 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 bido bido shoop 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 bido bido. Morning, good morning, rise and shine. Today's the day I make you mine. Shoop shoop bido bido. The sun is rising over the hay. I know it's gonna be one of the days. So morning, good morning, rise and shine. Hello and welcome to another of our inspiring leadership podcasts. The purpose of these podcasts is quite simply to learn from the best. We want over the course of the next few weeks and months to understand what makes a great business leader. How do they focus? How do they get people to follow their vision? And today we want to understand the role they play in society and a changing world. Albert Schweitzer said example is not the main thing in influencing others. It is the only thing. We will learn from experiences, good and bad, and that will always be our best teacher. There is always something to learn. Why invent pastry when we can use our grandmother's recipes? I'm Daryl Cook, the co-founder of law firm Gunnar Cook and the author of To Innovate or Not to Innovate. And today I'll be joined by Hassan Damluji, who is the Deputy Director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The foundation works to solve global issues that can impact all of humanity. Hassan has written a book called The Responsible Globalist, described by Bill Gates as a good book for people who care about solving global problems. Welcome, Hassan. Thanks very much for having me. Hassan, you're the Deputy director of the Gates Foundation, one of the most powerful charitable foundations in the world, amongst many things, saving countless lives from malaria, improving education in the US, searching for better ways to prevent AIDS, et cetera, et cetera. But the foundation and foundations in general uh, are not without their critics, most of which I think are unfounded and unfair, but there is one that, that I often struggle with, and that is around accountability and responsibility. Charitable foundations are often more powerful than governments, and they can actually usurp the role of governments quite often. In the Gates Foundation, for instance, I think there are just three trustees, I think that's right, who make all the decisions, Bill, Melinda, and Warren Buffett. It's an enormous influence at a few people's disposal, whereas governments, despite their inefficiencies, bureaucracy, and the enormous frustrations that they come with, do have the advantage of democratic rigor. What would you say to those critics? Yeah, well, look, it's a great question. Um, and I think the first thing to say is part of the accountability that does exist in society, even for organizations that aren't democratically elected, is that criticism and that questioning in you know, a society with a free media and the ability to say what you like, even to... You know, rich people or powerful people, you know, no one's above the law or, or above just criticism. And that, that's a good thing. So whilst, as you said, many of the things that are hurled at uh, the Gates Foundation have no grounding in fact, the principle that pe people should be asking questions and holding us to account is, uh, I think, certainly one that, that we would support and just try and make sure that it's at least a little bit sensible. Um, you know, this, uh, uh, among the more sensible criticisms is this question that you've raised about the difference between philanthropy and government and who should do what. But you know, one thing I want to make clear is that it, it's, uh, you know, as, as much of a compliment it is, as it is to us to say that we're more powerful than, than a government, uh, maybe a, a two-sided compliment. It, it's actually not really true at all. You know, um, even in uh, poorer countries, government is always the biggest game in town. And that's even more true in uh, wealthier countries. Um, you know, if you look at the entire economy of wealthy countries, between a third and a half in France, it's over a half of all of the GDP in the country is government expenditure. And even in poorer countries, it's at least 10% of the entire economy. Um, and if you compare us, and we're, you know, we are the largest foundation in the world, we spend about $5 billion a year. You mentioned we do work in education in America. Just the Californian education budget is nearly $77 billion a year. So if we spent 
all of our entire foundation's money just on Californian education, we would be a, a very small proportion of Californian education. Now in, in, in Kenya, the total government expenditure is $20 billion a year, $21 billion a year. So even if we spent all of our money on a, rel on a relatively poor and relatively small country like Kenya, we would still be a small proportion. If we put all of our money just into education in Kenya, we'd be about the same size as education in Kenya. But of course, that's not how we work. We, we haven't said, right, let's pick one country and tell the government, don't worry about education. We'll do the education system in Kenya. That would be a very silly way to spend our money. And we spend it, in fact, as you pointed out, across many, many priorities in many, many uh, countries, but also not for countries, for researchers to actually develop the, let's say, uh, uh, treatment for AIDS, as you mentioned. So, so actually, what... You know, what we do is not to displace governments at all, but across many, many countries and many, many issues, we try to add something with our very small proportion of money compared to governments that actually governments would struggle to do. And so one example is research into health problems. If you're the government of Kenya, it's your job to deliver the schools in Kenya and educate kids in Kenya but you have a disease in your country and you don't have the resources to invest in the scientists to come up with a new uh, response to that disease, which actually affects many countries. And it's hard sometimes for the government of Kenya, Chad, and for example, Angola to pool their resources together and together come up with the cure for a disease that's pre prevalent in Africa, for example. So, so actually things like research into new uh, uh, treatments for disease is exactly where we think philanthropy uh, should play. But even there, we're always trying to work with government. So for example, um, in um, CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemics Preparedness Innovation, it's a big fund to develop new vaccines for diseases that we uh, were part of setting up. You know, even in that, we are a very small proportion of the money. The Wellcome Trust, a British uh, foundation, is another foundation that's a donor. But almost all of the money comes from governments, in this case, richer governments that do uh, have the, the cash to spend on, on research. So really, in everything that we do, even in our day to day work, most of the money comes from governments. And that's how it should be. Um, and so, you know, people should be looking to criticize foundations. And when you're spending a lot of money, uh, you could do it in all sorts of ways, some of which good, some of which bad. Um, but it's certainly not true to say that we're that we're replacing governments. In fact, we want governments to do more and more of the kind of work that really saves lives that we're also trying to do. But, but I guess if the Gates trustees don't believe in something, they don't believe in the principles or in the project or something, then it just doesn't get supported. Where the difference is with the government's, it will get debated and, and there will be a decision, a wider democratic decision as to whether something gets funded or supported. Is that fair to say? Well, if, if, the, if our foundation's leadership doesn't believe in a project, then we won't fund it. But it's not true to say that it just won't get funded. Um, you know, m most of the things that get funded, uh, you know, we don't necessarily think is a great idea, but other people go ahead with that, whether it's governments or whether it's other people with their private money. Um, and, and you're right that the implication of that is that a world system that depends on Bill Gates to fund everything would be a very bad one, because what if he changes his mind? And so it's absolutely true that the majority of this work uh, to help people um, needs to come from governments, whether it's aid from the governments of rich countries or the governments of the poorer countries themselves. Um, so you're absolutely right. But I think if you have amassed uh, a lot of wealth, then I think um, choosing where you want to spend it in a way that helps poor people surely is, is, is something uh, good, but absolutely doesn't replace um, democratic accountability for where the vast majority of the money, which is that government money, uh, should be spent. I guess philanthropy has, has evolved just like uh, everything else. Um, Individuals in the 19th century took up the baton of improving the world. Florence Nightingale, Dr. Bernardo, 
Lord Shaftesbury, Octavia Hill, General Booth of the Salvation Army, Angela Burdett Coots of the Bank with her name, um, General Cad uh, George Cadbury, William Lever, uh, people like Joseph Rowntree and Arthur, uh, Arthur Guinness. And the list just goes on and on. And what is significant, though, I think, about many of those people is that they built major profitable businesses. Um, but yet what they're remembered for is their social reform. And, and their legacy is the social reform that they, that they led. And then came the onset of the welfare state, which led to an evolving belief that government should bear the responsibility of looking after the less fortunate. And we can argue just how well they do it. But surely every one of us, not just those um, great reformers, but every one of us has a responsibility to leave the world in a better place than we found it. Um, otherwise, you kind of wonder what it's all for. Um, and increasingly, government has shown its failings and its inability to deliver. So I suppose the question that I have is for business and chief executives at every level, not just um, with the wealth of the Gates Foundation, but in particular, for instance, SMEs in the UK employ about 16 million of the population. And every one of those businesses and CEOs should be doing more. They've got the resource. They've got the influence. They are untrammeled by bureaucracy and politics. They've got the markets close by. Um, what I mean by that is surrounding every business within a square mile will be the same issues that the whole of society faces, poverty, lack of opportunity, disability, loneliness, mental health, et cetera, et cetera. Shouldn't they be doing more? Shouldn't business be doing more? And how do we create that change? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. I mean, I mean there's a lot there was a lot in there. I mean, you're you're absolutely right. Um, really, the great tradition of philanthropy uh, that still has its legacy today started in the 19th century. Um, although, of course, um, you know, philanthropy existed before, but it was the huge wealth, but also the massive societal problems that came with the Industrial Revolution that spurred many of the, uh, or some at least, of the very wealthiest people to do something. Um, to, to help the poorest. And Britain has a very long and proud tradition in that. But really, the United States, where even more wealth eventually was created, um, is where philanthropy has had its, um, its, its kind of biggest and most generous uh, champions. And, and a lot of that evolution has been government responding to the criticisms of philanthropy and reining it in. So we, as an American-based foundation, are subject to very strict laws which came about in order to stop some of the excesses or bad behavior of the, the sort of the robber baron philanthropists, uh, some of whom you, you um, referred to in your list. And, uh, and, so, and so, for example, you know, I can't stay in a hotel if I'm traveling on as part of work. If, you know, any of our trustees own uh, a, a significant portion of that hotel. And so that actually affects, you know, um, where we travel. Uh, you know, we can't pay any of our foundation's money to any business where, you know, the Gateses have uh, uh, any kind of uh, significant stake. So, so it's interesting, you know, there was bad behavior in the past and actually there has been a lot of effort to, to evolve charity, not just from who's doing it, but also by governments trying to hold people to account more. Um, and, uh, and you're right, you know, the, 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 the observation was made that whilst it's nice that Joseph Rowntree is generous, that is not going to solve the social problems that we have. And as I said before, you know, it, it, it's right that it has come to be realized that the lion's share must uh, be done by government. But what sometimes, and this comes to you know, your, your, your main question, you know, what sometimes uh, is a shame is where it's portrayed as a dichotomy. It's either government or it's philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And in America, where a lot of people believe in very small government, they say, oh, yeah, you know, the philanthropists will sort it out. And that, as we've already discussed, is, isn't great. But the other side, and there are some European countries um, where the government has an even bigger role, you know, countries like France, where actually people feel like, look, the government should be doing it. And it's not the place of the private sector to get involved. And that is also uh, wrong because you're leaving on the table uh, so much value as you just set out. 
um, that businesses, uh, or whether it's the individual rich founders of them, or it's the business as a business can do um, to contribute to social equality. I mean, the danger is, look at a country like the UK, where so much of business, especially the wealth of business is in London, is if we leave these social problems to be sorted out by the square mile around the business, you're just going to have more funds going into London than you are into Sunderland. Uh, and so that's not, not okay. But, but nevertheless, businesses, whether they're global, national, or local to a town, um, can do so much. And I think what's hard for businesses, yes, you pointed out quite rightly that they don't have bureaucracy necessarily and that they have freedom of movement. But what constrains them is the need to make profit. What constrains them is the idea that this is a distraction. And that idea that this is a distraction, uh, that, that somehow doing good, uh, what, what could that be? Um, so helping to support a local school. Um, you know, London schools um, have improved really, really rapidly from being terrible um, 20, 25 years ago. And part of that is because there was increasing businesses in London backed schools, uh, academies that happened elsewhere, but probably less for reasons that I already described um, outside London. So, you know, we, we need to change that. It needs to be in every city. You know, you can support a local school, you can uh, offer apprenticeships, not just to the kids of your employees or your friends, but actually to the people who really need them and don't have educational opportunities in that mile you described around the bit, and so on and so forth. So, so I think the risk is that feels like a distraction to the business leader or to their board, their investors. And I think for me, one of the most powerful reasons that is really bottom line associated is that if you want the best talent, you need to tell a story to your employees of how they are helping with social issues. Because I think the days when uh, people wanted a job just for a job uh, have passed. And, you know, there are many people who are in the uh, position where any job will be better than, than not having a job. But if you really want the best talent, these are people with options. And it, increasingly, they want to choose something where they can tell a story to their friends, to their family, to themselves about how they are contributing. And if you can find a way for your business to be contributing, that is how to hold on to um, the best talents. Uh, and um, even for that reason alone, it's worth making sure that you're contributing to that to that mile surrounding your business as you employ. I think that's a that's a great point, and I, and I I do. I mean, I think you know over the years we've had uh, CSR kind of corporate social responsibility that's come into businesses, but it's largely become um, something that is a, a box that has to be ticked. Yeah, window dressing. hasn't really, yes, hasn't, and, and, I, and, it, and it's, it's largely failed, I think. You know, going out, you know, digging the same gardens, painting the same walls isn't really meaningful or, or, or in the way that it was meant to be. And, you know, I think is, and, and, and it's not helping the business either. So I think there needs to be a shift where leaders of businesses need to recognize uh as you know as you just said actually they can play i think michael porter at harvard talks about there is no reason why it can't be good for your business it should be good for your business and then it's sustainable um if it's not good for your business it won't be sustainable you won't continue to do it but i think it would be um a real step forward for leaders and chief executives to start to understand just what's around their businesses what's within the square mile because every issue you know it's like a microcosm of all the issues that we face in society and as you say if they get involved in the local schools if they get involved in the lo loneliness issues or the mental health issues then they can have a real difference and if you replicate that right across the country it's going to make a massive difference um, but it's getting, it's moving away from CSR and getting them to really understand that they can play a part and they can make a difference. I totally agree. And to me, as I uh, talk to businesses about their, you know, more sort of philanthropic type of activities, when we talk about CSR and I'm directed to the communications department, I know that it's not going to be a very fruitful conversation. So, you know, <laughs> I would say, is it the majority? I certainly don't have the data, but probably most um, big businesses put uh, CSR within communications. And you've, you've kind of killed the uh, um, opportunity for real impact by the incentive structure where really the goal is 
communication. I mean, if you want to stick it within an existing department, I would rather put it within HR in terms of what I was just talking about, about this is about how do we really develop and excite our talents? Because people know when they are your employees, whether you're really as a business trying to uh, do the right thing or whether you're just trying to communicate to some broader public. And so, you know, that would be one option to, to again, mainstream it into a business function, um, but, but not the communications department. And I, and I think actually just thinking about that as well, that the world, you know, as you know, as we both know, is changing very rapidly. And I think I read somewhere recently that Generation Z and the millennials are now uh, approximately about 75% of the world's population. So they've grown up with a different mindset and they expect, they expect something extra from business. Um, they expect them to be involved in the community and to show that they care. So, you know, the business leaders who aren't of that ilk need to respond to that. Yeah, and, and you're, you know, one of those people who is a business leader, it's law, you know, it's it's not that you have to, um, uh, you know, do this kind of thing and, and think about social responsibility in that way. But I have no doubt that your employees, you know, have that as one of the things that they would say about, oh, you know, what's what's going to cook like, you know, in terms of why are they proud or why do they enjoy going to work? Why is it harder to poach them to other firms? And I have that experience with other friends of mine who work in, you know, uh, not in philanthropy, but in um, thinking of an example in um, computer programming, where my uh, friend is really proud of the fact that his CEO is also someone who, you know, is out there writing books about this stuff, but actually giving opportunities to the, for, for their staff to get involved. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's about the culture you want in your organization. Yeah, I think that's, that, is, that, that is spot on. It's the culture. And I think it's about integrating that uh, doing good into the business. That they all, that the approach that the kind of Andrew Carnegie approach was very much with, that you earned money, you, you earned the money, and then you spent it on good causes. But I think the shift that uh, we're talking about here is actually involving business as you go along. Uh, in, involving the business in doing good as you uh, as you grow, and you know these days, uh, and it was less so in the past because philanthropy has grown. Is someone might get a job at the Gates Foundation? I can tell you, you know, pe- people, and they may be wrongly, uh, let's say, um, rosy-eyed about what what you know how exciting it is, but but it's amazing the the number of people in my you know broader network or that i come across that would you know are dying to work uh, at the gates foundation because they see it as a place which is dedicated to doing good and so we have you know incredibly uh, smart colleagues that i'm lucky enough to work with because we find it very easy to hire so the question for your business is i mean you being anyone listening or someone who's a, an employer is how can you compete with that um in terms of making your business an exciting place that people want to come and work can we move on to some of the um things that you bring out in your book which i found a fascinating read hassan actually um and you write about a global citizen what do you mean by that what is a global citizen yeah, I mean, it's quite a, it's become a, a phrase that, um, you know, people use. And, you know, the reason I wrote the book is because um, for the first time, really, that I was aware of, uh, around about uh, the time that, you know, about 2016, when politics was overturned globally, certainly in America and, 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 in, and in this country, is people started using the, that kind of terminology as a kind of insult. And specifically, it was when Theresa May, in her first speech to the Conservative Party conference as prime minister, said famously, if you think you're a citizen of the world, so global citizen, if you think you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere and you don't understand what citizenship means. So basically, a a global citizen, according to Theresa May, certainly in that speech, is someone who's essentially disloyal to their country and doesn't really get what it means to be British. So, so I'd never really interrogated uh, what I thought global citizen means. I mean, we as a, as a foundation, you know, my team, we fund an organization called Global Citizen. I had been interviewed recently before that speech by a magazine called Global Citizen. So this language was around me, but I hadn't really interrogated it. But I felt sure 
that I was one, whatever it meant, and that I wasn't disloyal to the UK. And certainly I didn't recognize Theresa May's kind of negative portrayal of it. And so really this book was an attempt to think through what, what do I think a citizen of the world uh, is? And I, I, what I came to is that, you know, what does it mean to have citizenship of somewhere? It means that you're a member of a community that, is, that has some meaningful level of equality. If you think of Britain, we're not all equal, not in wealth, not in, you know, in many ways, but there's, there's some idea of equality, right? There's some idea that, hey, we're all British. We all get a vote once we pass 18. You know, we, somehow, you know, you, we, 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 des- we all deserve the same NHS, right? Like there's some idea of equality about what it means to be citizens and, and uh, of at least of respect. And also it, the idea is if you're a citizen of a place that there's, there's, some, kind of, there's some kind of nation underlying that, right? So what I came to realize is that when people are going on about, I'm, I feel like I'm a global citizen, it's about belonging to the world as a community. And it's about this idea that the world somehow, if it's not yet, should be a kind of nation, a kind of place where you would be able to solve our problems. So I say, okay, the NHS says, well, let's collect, collect everyone's tax money and we'll put a hospital in every town not say leave Cornwall to their own because, you know, to hell with Cornwall. You say, no, we're all British and we'll... So, so imagine that kind of um, uh, dispensation at the global level. To me, that's what a global citizen is. It's someone who wants that, who's attracted by the idea of the international community, the, the hu- humanity really meaning something. Um, but what, was, what struck me as I was doing research for the book is that it's an aspiration, it's not a reality. There are no global citizens because we don't have that. Um, and so really a global citizen is someone who wants that and should be prepared to um, push towards it. And so to me, someone who should be prepared to push towards it is, is a responsible globalist. That's, what I, that's the title of the book. Um, it's an ist, a globalist, and another word that people you know, pour scorn on asked Donald Trump, he'll say a globalist is the kind of the antichrist. But to me, it's someone who wants the world to operate somehow together. Yeah, and I guess what it would mean is that our interests would become more aligned if we could achieve that. So at the moment, we've got these great issues in the world, whether it's human rights, climate change, immigration, etc. Um but we just seem to become more and more divided over these issues. Um, people seem to take nationalist positions or political positions. Um, what, how do we change that? Yeah, I mean, you say, you know, we need to have our interests aligned. And, and actually, I would claim our interests are aligned. So, so, the, so there are many reasons for optimism. Um, you know, we're not only more and more divided. There is a really strong positive side to the story. Um, uh, for, for reasons that are very troubling, our interests are aligned around climate change, where none of us can escape from until we find another planet that we could zoom off to. Um, you know, the coronavirus is, is another, and of course it's one of many pandemic threats, viruses that could cause pandemics that none of us can escape from. Um, so our interests are aligned sometimes for troubling reasons. Number two is even at a very mundane level, our lives have become aligned in a surprising way. You know, the best guess is that half of all people in the world, half of all humans watched the World Cup in 2018, a single sporting event. You know, that's way more than the previous World Cup. So for the first time, you're starting to get half or even you know, a majority of the entire world in every country um, participating in, whether it's a cultural thing, a sporting thing, you know, the, um, the Me Too movement as a social movement went throughout the world uh, and even into China. And, and as you know, the internet in China, there's this what they call the Great Firewall of China that separates their, their internet and, and they don't use, you know, Facebook, it's a different app. And yet the Me Too movement, you know, proved that that, that wall is not impermeable and it's spread across um, the world. So, there are, so whether it's uh, the risks we face, the mundane things we like watching on television, 
or the social movements that we're talking about and getting behind. There's so much um, that is operating on the world and that, and that people agree on. Of course, you're right to say there are massive, there's massive political polarization. It's not true to say that the political polarization of the current time is unique in history. I think what happens is when you have massive uh, economic and social change is that you have people trying to push forward and propelling that change and you have people uh, fighting against it. You have conflict. And, um, you know, the, there is certainly not a victory to the uh, people who want to divide the world. Mm -hmm. The World Trade Organization, the UN, the World Health Organization, despite Donald Trump's best intents, still stand. The, the fight has not been won by the populists who have, have won some elections. But there's a lot of, uh, uh, of, of political polarization. Think about the Industrial Revolution. You know, it created a kind of liberal economic capitalist consensus on the one hand, and it also spawns directly from the experience of the Industrial Revolution, it spawned communism, which sought to overturn capitalism. And for a hundred years, this was the huge polarization in society. I think we, as people in our generation, got used to a 1990s and early 2000s where it seemed that you know, Russia had kind of stopped being uh, an ideological challenger. China had uh, seemed to be following our model. Uh, and it seemed that the consensus of a kind of democratic, uh, global, open, internationalist, globalized, um, cosmopolitan world ha had kind of won out. And all that's happening, I think, is um, that globalization itself has created tension. So we just need to play them through and hold our nerve and win the battle of ideas. And that's the, that's the kind of essential thing I, I try and, and say in, in the book is we need to win the battle of ideas. And here's how, here's some, my suggestions of how. It's not about bashing immigration over people's head all day long until they cave in, because they won't cave in. They'll get more and more angry. And, and that's what I think we've tried to do. You know, the opening of uh, Eastern Europe to a single travel area with the UK in 2004 was not done with democratic uh, consent. I would always vote for that. My vote in the democratic process would be, yes, let's do that. But actually many people wouldn't have done. And they feel that um, they weren't listened to. They, they felt like the change was too fast. That's just one example of how, you know, if you don't take people with you, um, however much I might agree with something, you know, if we don't take people with us, we're not going to uh, win the battle of ideas. So we need to find where is the consensus? We all agree that we need to fight pandemics. We all agree, almost all of us, that climate change is the real thing. Um, so, you know, let's really work hard on those things where we do have consensus. That would be my advice. Um, and I think, you know, as you've, as you've alluded to, I think the Trump experience is, um people have had to respond by becoming more self-interested in uh, and, and retracted into their own havens as such. Um, do we not just need better leaders? How do we get better leaders? Are the better leaders going into business, going elsewhere? And shouldn't we attracting those people into government? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, um, yeah, and, and perhaps I should have said this even earlier, but before I comment on British politics, I should make very clear that everything I'm saying is in my personal capacity and not the position of the Gates <laughs> Foundation. But personally, you know, I have been uh, you know, unimpressed um, you know, uh, by the political leadership we have in this country. And I think coronavirus has really exposed some of those, um, some of those weaknesses. But as I already implied, you know, I was pretty unimpressed by uh, Theresa May's uh, conference speech back in 2016. And you talk about how do you get the best leadership? You know, it's tough. Um, I think going into politics is not a very attractive profession to a lot of people. And so you're narrowing yourself. It's not, we don't want everyone to go into politics, but you'd love um, the career that ends in leadership of the country to be one that attracts some of the best people so that hopefully one of them might get the job. And it's not a very attractive career. 
Why is that? Is that because of so you're saying that's because of social media or because of the the the, uh, the poor remuneration or what's the reason that it's not attractive? Because surely if you have a passion to change things, it's the best place to be. It it really is. You know, we talked earlier about how government is the biggest game in town, whether you're Somalia or whether you're um, the United States of America. Uh, and if you really want, and government like philanthropy. Its only goal is meant to be just helping the people, right? That's the point of government. We give them our taxes just to help us, not to make money for themselves or anything like that. So like philanthropy, but on a much bigger scale, your day job is just to figure out the problems and solve them. And so what an opportunity that is. And I think that is what remains uh, the, the real attraction of government. You don't get paid a huge amount compared to what a skilled person, a highly skilled person could, could get in other, in other places. But I don't know if that's really the, the truly insurmountable uh, uh, object. It certainly doesn't help attract people in. But I think it's the, it's the abuse. You know, if, if you're a famous person in music or film or in other walks of life, even a CEO, think of Elon Musk, who's you know done a, a said and done a, a bunch of things that have attracted criticism. You will be attacked, but you can get away with some stuff. I think if you're a politician, you can't get away with even the stuff you didn't do. And it's a challenge because, as I started with, we need criticism, we need accountability. The last thing we want is a system, and many of them exist around the world, where the political elite is untouchable. And of course, uh, with power and no accountability, they inevitably get up to all kinds of no good. But the level of vitriol, the, the, the hate mail, the, 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 the belief that seems to have emerged that politicians are always essentially bad people, um, doesn't make it a very attractive uh, career, you know, whether it's the hate for Boris Johnson or the hate for Jeremy Corbyn, you know, there is no side of the, it used to be that the Tories were kind of hated, but Labour got a good um, shake with most of the public. And now it seems that, uh, uh, that, you know, we haven't got it right. Is it social media? You know, Diana was hounded down and treated ter terribly in the age of the tabloids and before even mobile phones most of the time. So I, I think you know, I'm a, a, someone who, who likes to dampen down a little bit this idea that social media has completely transformed the world as if those problems didn't exist before. Um, but maybe it's part of it. Maybe the fact that everyone, maybe even more than social media, just the fact that everyone has a high quality camera on their phone in their pocket at all times. And so, you know, maybe in the past, politicians would have um, got away with it just because no one had recorded it. But anything you say could be taken in, in the wrong way. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I really don't know how to solve this one, because the last thing you want to do is to throw the baby out with the bathwater and stop accountability. But it's not working. Yeah, I think, uh, and 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 attacking that free press doesn't see, you know, doesn't get taken in the direction that we want to go. I guess either. So you're right. Getting the balance right just seems at the moment to be almost impossible. It can come back, you know. We in the UK have gone through really polarizing politics, both over Brexit, and now I think you know, look at this pandemic, where for whatever reason we have been pretty much the worst affected major country in the world, major economy in the world. Um, people are gonna get angry. You know? <laughs> maybe, if, maybe if they have a better run, um, they can restore some faith. Um, but how do you do that when it's such a, an unappealing uh, profession? I think the opportunity is there for a great leader to really um, seize the day and to start restoring faith. Uh, but wow, uh, I've got a lot of respect for someone who's prepared to plow their entire life into that pretty thankless process of trying to be that leader. One of the things that uh, you write about in the book, which, I, which really made me think actually, was what you describe as the arrogance of the West. Though you never really, I don't think you actually really use that word, 
but you do say that to be described as Western has meant being at the heart of everything. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, and you know, to be clear, I'm, I'm not one of these people that thinks that you know, white people or the West or you know, Europeans are kind of essentially bad um, and you know, a worse kind of human than others, which sometimes this kind of criticism of uh, the great unfairness that has created the world we live in uh, and ends up looking like. I think people everywhere uh, are equally liable to fall into some of the traps um, some of them that we just dis- discussed, you know, how, how power corrupts. And, and the fact is that there's been a lot of power in the hands of uh, people of European origin. So Europeans, but then also Americans who are largely of European origin, Australians and so on. The, 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 these people um, have uh, uh, been very, very powerful because the Industrial Revolution started in Europe. Um, but as China becomes uh, very powerful, they have the same risks that they need to avoid. This Western thing as a concept um, is problematic for me because it's a shorthand for us versus them. And the us is, you know, people like us, you know, Europeans are white, probably, or, you know, sort of democratic, they're richer, they're they're a bit more intelligent, aren't they? Or they're smarter or they're better educated. That's a nicer way of putting it. And they're, oh, they're culturally, uh, should we say democratic? But what we really mean is sort of better. And they're just better, aren't they? You know, the West is, is better. And it's also um, where we care about. It's the thing we care oh, yeah, we should, uh, There are other humans somewhere, but actually let's talk about the West because that's what I know about. That's what I care about. That's the us, right? And that's lazy. It's lazy and it replicates the kind of thinking that did come from a previous era that was one of imperialism and colonialism and the superiority of one race over another. And when you really pick apart what people are saying, it's meaningless. So, you know, when you say the West and, you, and you're thinking about democracies, a lot of times, are, well, in the West, blah, 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 you're thinking about democracies. Well, most people who live in democracies, a majority of all humans that live in democracies live in India as a country because there are 1.4 billion people that live in a democracy is more than all of the of people in Europe and North America. So are you talking about democracies? Like, let's talk about democracies, but that's not, there's nothing Western about that. Are you talking about rich countries? You know, sometimes, oh, in the West, we love, you know, iPhones or whatever. But if you, are you talking about economics? Well, actually Japan is not in the West. There's 120 million people and it's the second biggest economy in, in the world. Korea, Singapore, are we talking about, let's talk about rich countries. Figure out what you're talking about and don't lazily assume that people outside Europe, North America, and maybe Australia are irrelevant to what you're talking about. Because once you start being a little bit more thoughtful about the breadth of humanity and the breadth of democracy or wealth or whatever you're talking about, you'll realize that we are more united as a world and, and, and we can start realizing that. Once we start talking more as a world, we, we can start feeling more as a world. You know who uses the term West and Western more than anyone? It's people who aren't in Europe and North America. If you go to the Middle East, Africa, Asia, anywhere, outside what's thought of as the way they say West, they're Western, he's Western, that's Western. If you want people to feel that democracy is really a global phenomenon, if you want people to adopt your ideas, the biggest enemy you have is presenting yourself and those ideas is essentially Western because then people will think that they're foreign. And the truth is there's nothing uh, Western about democracy. It emerged in a Middle Eastern country called Greece. Greece has got nothing to do with Western Europe historically. You know, the, the ancient Greeks who invented democracy, the people they had heard of were the Egyptians who were just across the water, the Lebanese who were just across the water, the Iraqis, the Mesopotamians, they'd never heard of Britain. So, you know, there's, so there's, there's, real, uh, uh, there's a lot of imagination going on when we pretend that these things that we call Western are somehow ours. Agriculture came from the Middle East. We don't call it, oh, you're being very Middle Eastern. You're not being Middle Eastern. Agriculture is a global thing. Democracy is a global thing. And I think the more we start talking about that, the more successful we'll be in what I was talking about earlier, which is winning the war of ideas, winning the battle of ideas. Uh, And actually, as you point out in the book, 
which will surprise a lot of people listening, I think, that we already have a set of global goals, you know, from ending war to ensuring gender equality, protecting the environment. And it's signed up to by just about every government on earth um, with specific targets to, re- to be reached by 2030, et cetera, et cetera. But it is almost as though they're a secret. I think not, not a lot of people would really know how many governments have signed up to those goals and the targets that we're aiming to, to hit. Why, why is that? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question and one that I take on in the book and say what we've got to do is turn these global goals into something that people really believe in. And dusty old institutions can be things people believe in, like the NHS in the UK. You know, it's a ministry of health. It's a boring old hospital, but it's who we are as British people. No, I always say no other country would have put their ministry of health in their Olympic Games opening ceremony. So how do you take a dusty bureaucratic thing and turn it into something that people are really proud of? I don't think the globe, I don't think we should be too uh, down about how many people can count all 17 global goals or know how many countries uh, have signed up to it. After all, it's at the global level, it's like a political manifesto in a way. What will we achieve over the next X years? How many people read the Tory or Labour or Lib Dem manifesto in the last election? They haven't, you know, I didn't, and I'm pretty engaged in politics. I won't embarrass you by asking you if you did. You know, I I think it's okay. I think people can get engaged in politics without reading the manifesto, but you do need there to be a debate about uh, about politics and equally about global, um, you know, about solving our global issues. So I think if you step back and you realize that of the 17 global goals, something like six of them are somehow to do with climate change. Well, Climate change has broken through as an issue. You know, if you talk to people, if you survey people scientifically, as as does happen, they will tell you that the majority of people in every single country in the world not only recognizes climate change as a problem, but says that global institutions need enforcement powers for climate change. Now, that is an amazingly strong statement, not only of their realization that the issue is important, but that actually they want some kind of global system to enforce countries because they know that we have to do this together. You know, if one country keeps burning coal and everyone stop, everyone else stops, we'll still have a heated world. So I do think the political salience of the biggest issues have cut through. A lot of the other ones though are about helping poor people and we're not doing a great job at explaining why that is important to the uh, wealthier countries. You know. In Britain, there has been a long-standing campaign to stop us being as generous as even the Conservative Party wanted us to be uh, until recently. And finally, that campaign has now started to succeed with Britain slashing its aid budgets. Already, the 0.7% that we were contributing to global issues is a tiny amount, 0.7. You know, our health service to look after British people is well over 120 billion, what's it gone up to now? 130, 140 billion pounds a year. And we're saying a tenth of that. So for all the entire world, you know, 0.7%, I hope we're all giving more than 0.7% of our income just as charity, whether it's to beggars in the street or whether it's to an established charity. So we haven't yet convinced uh, the public that they should be uh, generous with regards to helping poor people really at a level that underscores that we're all humans and the desperate poverty people live in. I mean, to live in poverty of, of $2 or less per day per person is really, really desperate poverty. That is hard for people who live in the UK to understand, you know, uh, uh, you know, a billion people without a toilet, you know. So, um, but there are issues like this virus and, like climate change, which actually affects rich people too, where we get it. Um, but what we need to do is really focus on those and not turn... Go- why, why do people say that globalist is an insult? Why is a globalist a bad person? Because a globalist is meant to be someone who pushes for immigration, no matter what, and who pushes for some kind of capitalist economy that gets them rich and doesn't look after everyone else, some kind of globalization that is unequal. Well, 
what if we became known as pushing for solving climate change, ending the threat of pandemics and solving global poverty? That's basically what the global goals are. It's all they say. You don't need to learn all the targets. You know, that is what we need to do if we want to change globalists from being a bad word to being a, a positive word. One of the, kind of the most contentious issues in this country, for instance, has been this immigration. It's very contentious. Um, and I, I'm, you know, many would doubt that, you know, as a globalist, you would believe in freedom of movement. Um, but those views against immigration have come from right across the political spectrum, whether you're, you're a Trumpet supporter or a Brexiteer, they go cut right across the political spectrum. It just seems to me sometimes that there's, that I, I think people would believe that everybody has the right to live their life a certain way and we owe that to people. There then seems to be a lack of ideas about how we deal with immigration, how we support it. You know, for instance... You know, I do accept that Britain is a small country, that it is limited in, in its space that it does. But there's no reason why Britain couldn't come together with other governments to fund huge infrastructure projects in large empty spaces of lands across the world to help to solve the refugee crisis. It doesn't always have to be in this country, or does it? Should there be just complete free movement everywhere? Or do we, are there other answers, to, are there other solutions? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. This idea that Britain is a small country is quite, is quite amusing to me. You know, one of the slogans of, um, of, of Brexit was Britain is full. I mean, it wasn't an official slogan of the campaign, but the number of times I heard, whether it was watching Question Time or talking to a taxi driver or just, you know, talking to people, Britain's full. And... I don't know if anyone's ever taken a train ride through Britain, but you look out the window and it's just field upon field upon field upon field. So, you know, it's not true that Britain is full. Um, but I think one of the problems with uh, the conversation about immigration is that the people who don't want as much immigration often don't say things that are very sensible when held up to scrutiny like I just did, this idea that Britain is full. Um, by the way, the total population of London is about the same now as it was in 1939. And between 1939 and sort of last year, it was less than it was in 1939. You know, so this idea that sort of unprecedented crowding and, and, and everything is not true. Why do people who want less immigration say things that don't hold up to economic or, you know, or factual scrutiny is it because they're the stupid ones and we're the clever ones i say we i support immigration you know am i the clever one is that is that why uh that's that's the idea right that's what people who like immigration think is oh people who like immigration are more educated wealthier smarter and it's because they're so stupid they don't they, they say things that are not only wrong these people who don't like immigration uh but that it doesn't even make sense I did a lot of thinking and research about immigration uh, uh, in thinking about my book. And I started to understand why uh, people say things that don't necessarily hold up to, to scrutiny. And it's not because they're stupid and it's not because they're wrong. You see, the debate about immigration touches on something that's hard to describe because it's about what it means to be in a human group. And that is something evolutionary. Our feeling of being in a group that we belong to and that we trust is an evolutionary thing. Doesn't mean it can't be affected by culture, but it's hard to describe. And over time, you know, immigration has always been framed as an economic thing. And the economics don't stack up for people that don't like immigration. And so they often make economic arguments that make no sense. Or then they even resort to physical arguments. There's just no space. Well, look at that field. Why can't we build a house? Oh, because we need the food. Well, we import most of our food anyway, and that field's empty. Well, so the reason it doesn't make sense is because we have framed the argument about economics, and they f they can't win that argument, but they know that there's something. They We haven't convinced them. Why haven't we convinced them if they're so wrong? It's because actually immigration isn't about economics, and it's not about how much space there is in the country. It's about feeling that you belong to a group. And for whatever reason, there are many people who feel 
that the number of people who have come into this country, other countries, by the way, it's the same in poor countries. It's not just rich white people who don't like immigrants. Um, is that the number of people who have come into their country, the level of foreignness, however they define that, they don't even define it. It's just a feeling is that they feel less part of a group that they trust than they used to. And that has an effect on politics because you can't have a democracy. You can't have a, a society unless people do feel part of a group that they trust. Now, for me, the answer is not over the long term to reduce immigration. The whole point of my book is how do you make humanity at large a society that feels trust so that actually when a Kenyan arrives in London, you, ought to, you don't feel uh, that level of foreignness towards them because actually the community of trust you feel that you belong to is humanity and not just you know, your village or your country. But we haven't got there yet. And we can't just force people to accept that they are wrong and that, oh, you don't feel like you are in a community of trust. Well, just put up with it because I do and I'm fine with it. And I'm, by the way, I'm smarter than you. No, that's not the way to win the argument. It's not the way to win the war of ideas. And the only, there's no scientific, you can try to scientifically measure economic impacts. You can't scientifically measure whether people feel in a community of trust except doing, having an election, having a vote. That's how you do it. You ask people, are you comfortable with this? Or are you not comfortable with this? And if they're not comfortable with it, there's a problem. By definition, even if you're comfortable with it, there's a problem. And so you have to respond to that problem. You have to work harder at winning the war of ideas over time, if you're someone who wants, you know, who wants more immigration. And maybe you'll win the next election. The country, and by the way, these things do go in both ways. The country in the G7, uh, the biggest seven kind of democracies in the world who are most in favor of immigration in terms of their people is Britain. Because after people voted for Brexit and they felt like it was under control or that it would be under control and that, and actually the people who didn't vote for Brexit felt even more angry. You know, we're now more pro immigration than any other country in, uh, out of our peers. So these things do go in cycles. You can win the war of ideas over time. Um, and you have to understand why people don't like immigration, even if you do. And, and let me come back finally to this idea of being more intelligent or more educated or, or richer or, or just, you know, that, that, that makes people feel so superior who are pro-immigration. Measurably, the comfort that people have or discomfort that people have with immigration is linked to this thing called social capital. And social capital is about the network you have, the number of friends you have, how much you know, do you vote, do you get involved in the community? And what happens is when uh, newcomers come into a community, social capital net uh, overall declines. That's the cost of immigration. Wealthier people, people with better education have more social capital to start with. So it's not surprising that they don't feel the cost of immigration in the same way because they can tolerate that reduction. What, how does that work specifically? My next door neighbor may be an immigrant that I can't speak the same language of, but actually my network is not my next door neighbor. I went to a university, I have friends all over the country, all over the world. And so I have more resilience in my social network um, to tolerate in the, in the, the social uh, consequences of immigration. I may even speak a foreign language that means I can talk to my neighbor. If your entire social network is your street or the few streets around your house, then the impact of you of that neighbor is going to be more. So it's not that they're stupid or they don't get it or they're wrong about the economics. We need to understand why people have different experience of immigration and just bring them along with us. And if they win the, the, the election, you know, that, then we have to tolerate it, however much it, it upsets us. <laughs> It has been really fascinating, Hassan, and I think we somehow need to bring this to an end. I think in summary, what I take from what you're saying is that we're, we're very unlikely to ever have a global government. That's not like to happen. There's too many self-interests. It's a utopian dream, but we should all be thinking like globalists. We should all be thinking outside our, uh, uh, our own comfort zones and thinking more like globalists and, and what are our effects in the world uh, and, and thinking differently. Would you sum it up like that? 
I do think so. And I think whether it's, you know, climate change or whether it's this latest virus, it really shows it's it showed people that a coal power fire station in South Africa or a, a, a strange, you know, disease in a bat in a cave in, in uh, southern China does matter to you. Um, so we have to think about how we can coordinate and work together and trust each other as a world, because otherwise we'll never solve those or, or other problems. Thank you, Hassan. That was so inspiring. I kind of wish now that you were running the world. I hope that you've all enjoyed it as much as I have. If you want to hear more from Hassan, I do recommend his book, The Responsible Globalist, published by Penguin Books. Thank you for listening. Shine.